team for the terrific work they've done on the X-47. Have you guys seen the, you, you, that was one of the biggest stories of the week when the X-47 launched off the bush. It was, it was just stunning. And um, I really want to call out Jamie Crosgrove, Emily Bertishaw, uh, David Scrobolis, uh, Mikhail Lauren Poole, and uh, Kelly Burdick. Uh, as well as the team on the bush. Just terrific, terrific work, and uh, they've really done a great job. There's another big milestone coming up uh, uh, this month, the July, I'm sorry. They're, they're, we're going to try an arrested landing of the X-47, uh, which, uh, if successful, will just be a tremendous uh, leap forward in that program and that, that experimental program. Um, I don't know if you know it, but we had, um, we had uh, four MCs deploy on short notice to JTF Gitmo, so I really want to applaud them for their Flexibility, that's MC1 Richard Brunson, along with MC1 uh, Barua, Patrick, uh, MC1 Patrick Ratcliffe, and MC2 Brandon Keck. So thanks very much for, I don't know if you're tuning in today, but thanks for being willing to go on short notice down there for a very, very important mission. JTF Gitmo doesn't get a lot of attention unless something typically goes wrong or there's something, uh, or there's a, a, a big trial. But let me tell you, uh, and, and I've talked to people who've been down there, that is a, it's a critical mission. Uh, it's very, very important to our national security, and uh, while it doesn't always bubble up, um, the, the talent that we put down there really matters and makes a big difference. Um, you probably saw my trip report um, from my trip out west, uh, and I was very glad I got that opportunity. To, uh, it was focused on really two things. I mean, it was an opportunity to get to talk to everybody, of course, but really I wanted to go get much smarter on LCS. I had not stepped foot aboard an LCS, and I thought that was a real gap in my own credibility and knowledge on this issue. So I went out there and I had a chance to go aboard Independence. I talked to the crews of both uh, the Freedom and the Independence, the Freedom crew that's back uh, in San Diego waiting to, actually they're going to deploy here soon out to Singapore. Uh, and it was eye-opening. I learned a lot. I put that all in my email to you, but I, I want to definitely uh, give a big shout out to the PAC fleet team uh, and to, uh, and to uh, Lieutenant Commander Clay Doss specifically, who's in Singapore right now and just doing uh, an amazing job uh, with Freedom and her crew and the media coverage that they're getting out there. Uh, it's, it's a big deal. I mean, and we don't do this off. I mean, I can't remember a time in, that I've been in the Navy where we have deployed essentially an experimental platform, operationally deployed, and that's what we're doing with Freedom. And I think we forget that sometimes. You know, she looks like a ship. She is a ship. I mean, she... And, you know, she has a crew and she's doing, doing things that Navy ships do. And we forget that this, is, this, this ship, that particular hull uh, and this program is still experimental. We're still, we're still learning things. And the things that we're learning on freedom, particularly from this deployment, will, will carry forward into follow-on ships and hull numbers of that variant. And we're doing the same on independence. I mean, it was very clear to me out there that... They're learning things on independence that, that they're going to apply to, to whole numbers four and six and follow on. So it's, it's, it's important to remember that as we talk about LCS, that this is an experimental platform and, and things aren't always going to go well. And that's, that needs to be okay as long as we're learning from it and carrying it forward. But anyway, Clay's doing a great, a great job. And I mean, and it's not just, I mean, I've heard that unsolicited from reporters that have gone out there uh, to cover Freedom's uh, deployment. Um, I heard it from the CNO staff when he was out there. I heard it from the secretary staff when he was out there. All of them talk about what a great job Clay's doing. So Clay, if you're listening in or you're going to listen in later, thanks again for everything. RTC, Retreat Training, Training Center in Great Lakes. Um, I, I want to call out Matt Comer and his team as well. I don't know if you noticed it, and, and also the, uh, our folks in OI2. Um, I don't know if you noticed it, but just the last Friday, uh, we did the first... Now, it was experimental as well, but we did the first live stream of an RTC graduation. And as far as I know, it went off flawlessly. I, don't, I think there was some, maybe some minor audio kinks here and there, but otherwise it went really well. And I think that's just a terrific service that we're going to be able to provide to families. And I, I only know this now because my son graduated from Great Lakes just a few weeks ago, but they can only have four family members at the graduation. And the graduation hall is big, but when you... When you're talking about you know eight to nine hundred recruits graduating each and every week, it fills up pretty quickly. So each recruit is limited to four people, um, and and you know we we had our four there just like everybody else. And um, so there's a lot of family that that 
my son Colin would have loved to have had at his graduation that they, they couldn't go and uh, we sent them, you know, we sent them photographs and stuff. But this way now, all those families all over the country will be able to watch it live. And it was, I thought it was superb. Anything to, Chris, anything to add? It was, went very well for us. Yeah, I thought so too. It's a great initiative, great sense of teamwork between Matt and his team and Chris and his team here. So I thought it was uh, just a terrific opportunity and it was just uh, real successful. Um, I want to hit just a couple other things before I take, take the questions. One is uh, sexual assault and sexual assault prevention. Uh, you, uh, all of you know we're in the midst of doing a stand down, uh, Navy wide, fleet wide, uh, and it is an issue that has um, gotten a lot of attention on the Hill and in the press and in our own ranks, as it should. CNO talks about it being a safety issue, a readiness issue. It is, it is that, and of course it's more. It's also a crime. Uh, and I think we all understand the severity of it uh, and the need to get at this problem. And there are a lot of initiatives underway right now uh, from a leadership perspective to try to, to get at this uh, and to eliminate it from the ranks. Uh, you're probably you're gonna see some message traffic, I think, later this week uh, from the vice chief uh, about leadership accountability, individual accountability, organizational accountability. And he's also going to issue some organizational changes that are, are coming. I don't want to get ahead of the message traffic, but you'll start to see that this week. Uh, and of course, leadership in the Pentagon continue to work with leadership on the Hill uh, to get at some of these legislative proposals that you've seen uh, out there. There's more than 20 of them uh, that are in the markup process right now. I don't know where that's going to go, uh, but I can tell you that leadership is really laser focused on this as an issue. Um, and, um, and so, it is, and so we're, we're all dedicated, all of us, to, to stamping this out. It is also, um, in addition to all those things, it's also a communications issue as well. Um, there are, we communicators have a special role, I think, to play uh, in this issue. Uh, and where's Senior Chief Weatherspoon? Where did, there she is. If you haven't read the Senior Chief's All Hands Magazine piece, uh, on sexual assault and survivors speaking out. I highly, highly encourage you to do it. Actually, it's not just, don't just read it, it's a multimedia story. Uh, there are, if you go on All Hands Magazine, you can see actual interviews with some of the people that she quotes in her piece. First of all, it's superbly well written uh, and well done, well composed, uh, but it's also very powerful, very visceral, because um, you're reading about the impact that this crime has on sailors who have fallen victim to it. Uh, and the perspective that these people bring to the discussion of the issue is, is just vital. Uh, and again, it, there's no way you can get through that story without really sort of feeling inside uh, the effect of this crime. So, but that's a great example. What the senior chief did is a great example of how we need to, to do a better job talking about this issue and about the fixes, not the fixes, that's probably putting it too blithely, the, the efforts by leadership to try to get at the crime. Um, it is, uh, it is, uh, it's a most human story. There's no question about that. Uh, and, uh, and we need to start telling it in, in those ways. And so you're going to start to see uh, soon, I hope this week, um, we're going to start to uh, advertise, publicize, advertise, not a good verb, publicize uh, results of court martial. So sailors that uh, go to courts martial for sexual assault, uh, there's a result. Some are convicted, some are convicted in different ways, and some, quite frankly, are acquitted. Um, but we're going to start publicizing the results of those court marshals, uh, courts martial uh, from corporate Navy, from Navy.mil. Now, a lot of those results are already pub in the public domain. Some regional commanders uh, put out summaries, routine, routinely put out summaries of their uh, courts martial. Um, what we're going to do is going to roll it up from the whole, from all the regions, and just put it out monthly. I think that's the plan, uh, monthly, right, Matt? Um, and I think we're going to start with the first, the first thing we're going to put up. Hopefully, this week is going to be the first f five months of the year. So we'll kind of catch everybody up on where we are in in uh, calendar year 13, and then we'll do it monthly thereafter. Uh, the other thing that we're going to start to do because uh, we want to encourage reporting, uh, we want. Uh, sailors to know that uh, that reports are taken seriously. Uh, we're going to start uh, putting a summary out weekly. Is that right, Matt? Weekly, of uh, the 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 sit reps, the actual 
uh, reports that come out every week, uh, actually, they, regrettably, every day, there are sit reps filed uh, where sailors are uh, coming forward and reporting that they've, they've been a victim of sexual assault. So we're going to summarize those uh, once a week. Now, we're not going to list each one. We have to be very mindful that we preserve the confidentiality of the, of the victims and that we don't prejudice the investigative process because each one of these reports gets investigated. Uh, but we are going to do sort of a summary. So it'll be like, you know, hey, this week the Navy, um, uh, the Navy uh, received X number of reports of sexual harassment, sexual assault, and then it'll break it down, this many afloat, this many ashore, this many involved alcohol, that kind of thing. So you get, so there's a sense, a, a sense of transparency inside the lifelines and outside the lifelines of the Navy uh, that we take these reports seriously, they are coming in, and they're all being investigated, and here's, and here's, here's sort of a compendium of them. Uh, we really think that that's important. And, uh, it'll, first of all, it, it, it's important for us to be transparent about this. This is clearly an issue that has captured the, uh, the attention of the American people, again, rightly so. Uh, but it, so it's an issue of transparency, but I also think it, we believe, we hope, that it will help encourage uh, more people to come forward and, and report when, they, when they've experienced uh, something like that. Um, and then I just want to go real quickly back to the Senior Chief Weatherspoon's uh, story. Be, uh, and I should have come, I should have come to her story last because it's a, a segue I really wanted to make was the issue of storytelling. Um, again, you probably saw my, my team PA. I won't uh, belabor the issue uh, more than I did in that email, but I'm very, very serious about what I wrote. Uh, we, we, uh, we have an amazing talent in the Navy. We have sailors that are doing just incredible things all over the world. And we have just as incredible MCs in the Navy who are, are phenomenal at fashioning content, just the way Senior Chief Weatherspoon did. Um, and those are the kinds of stories I want us to focus a little bit more on. I'm not suggesting that we don't do your routine press releases or hard news and you know, that the AP style doesn't still apply. It does. We still have to, we still have to inform uh, when things happen, when there's a contract award, when there's a mishap, of course. Uh, but what I really want us to try to focus on more are those kinds of visceral human stories and try to talk about who we are, share the story of the Navy through the eyes of those in the Navy and what they're doing. Uh, again, the talent out there, is, it, it's, it's, it's evident. I mean, I went aboard Stennis and I, I wrote about this, but I mean, the things that the Stennis media department are doing, it's, it's eye-watering. I mean, I, I, I just could never have seen that happen uh, when I was uh, a lieutenant on Forrestal. Uh, but it's just, they are just incredibly talented and they're doing great work. And that's the kind of stuff that I want to make sure we're folding up. Uh, it is, it is, you know, we, we all join the Navy for something inside. You know, it's, it's so easy for us to get fixated on the stuff, uh, the hardware. And we are a, we are a, a uh, platform centric service. There's no question about that. Uh, but sailors operate that stuff. Sailors man that stuff. Sailors make that stuff work. And those are the stories I want us to just focus a little bit more on. Okay? I'm going to stop now because I've been told I've gone on long enough. Are there any questions? Do we have any from over there? With new technologies and innovations, training and education should be easier to access than ever. Will the Navy offer any online training opportunities via web webinars or online colleges for PA professionals? The question comes from uh, Jennifer Zimigel from the U.S. Uh, Naval Hospital in Guam. Thanks, Jennifer. It's a great question. We already are. Bruce, I'll invite you to chime in uh, here as well. But we already are um, doing some webinars uh, and offering some kind of uh, online, I don't know if you call it training, but certainly opportunities to learn and to be exposed and to participate in national conversations. But you have anything you, you want to add to that? Uh, just sorry, could. Come on up so they can see you, Bruce. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, what the uh, Admiral is uh, talking about is uh, we've had a couple of sessions so far. We've called it Beyond Training, uh, but we're going to change the name, as we shouldn't do, but it's better. It's, it's really a, a virtual symposium session, and it's a kind of thing, like if you went to one of our symposia, that uh, it would be in a plenary session. Uh, we've uh, done one on the, uh, the power and perils of uh, propaganda. Uh, we had the curator of the uh, 
U.S. Uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum come and talk about that. And then we also had a, uh, a gentleman uh, who's the, uh, the leader of the uh, USC uh, Center for the Digital Future uh, come and, and talk about the, uh, the internet and the, uh, the trends on the internet. Uh, next month, uh, we are going to have um, a team from uh, Chinfo OI2 uh, talk about Chinfo uh, social media. Uh, so that'll be the, the next one to tune into. And I remember right, we're doing it on the 16th, I believe. Uh, there'll be a team PA that's going to be uh, coming up very shortly uh, about that. But you can, uh, in person here in the Pentagon, you can attend, but we are also recording those and uh, putting them on the, uh, the Navy uh, live stream page uh, for your, uh, your training opportunity as well whenever you uh, want to access it. Thanks. Great. What else? Chris. I had a question about the o o fours and the, and the numbers. I just want to make sure I heard you right. We're, we're down nine folks to yeah. the number of billets that we have. Is right. that something, and I realize you guys are still working, is that something that you think uh, you'll try to make up through uh, deeper uh, zones uh, or going after o fours? I mean, should we be out? I mean, I, I know we should be recruiting anyway, but I mean, should we be looking for folks um, that are in that early o four range yeah. to bring them in? I mean, how, what, what's the best way forward for that? We're, I don't want to get too far ahead of the zone discussion. I mean, we're certainly looking at uh, zones in the future and what they're going to look like, and I don't have any hard and, for, uh, hard and fast answers to that right now. Um, and we have to be somewhat mindful of, uh, you know, um, uh, bringing somebody in as an 04, you can do that. Um, and there have been examples where people have done very well starting late in the community, so it can be done. I don't anticipate trying to make up the, the difference or the, the, the nine through that alone. Um, so yeah, we are looking at the health of zones moving forward, as we always do, but particularly with that bubble in mind, that wedge in mind. Um, and we're very healthy at Ensign and JG, and we're very healthy at Lieutenant. Um, so to some degree, it'll work its way out. And we, we also had the flexibility you know, of you know, some billets you can man that billet with uh, either uh, you know, one up or one down, and it depends on the job. Um, so we're looking at a, sort of a, a wide scope of, of ways to get at it. I'd rather not get into the zone discussion just yet, but, uh, but that's certainly one option. I, I will, I will want to piggyback, though, on one thing uh, that you said about recruiting. Does that mean I have 30 minutes left or I've used up 30 minutes? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I guess, yeah, if it's an hour, I guess. <laughs> I was a history major. <laughs> Walked right into that one. Um, but Chris brought up a good point about recruiting. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to formulate these thoughts in my mind, and there's a team PA in my brain coming to you here, hopefully soon, about recruiting. The message is going to be we all can be recruiters. We all should be recruiters, um, both on the officer and the enlisted side and the civilian side, quite frankly. Now I know there's a hiring freeze in place right now. Hopefully that'll get lifted. Um, but there's immense talent out there. I talked about it inside the lifelines, outside the lifelines. It's incredible. Um, and uh, you've heard me say this before, and if you haven't, uh, uh, there are 40,000 people in the United States right now who are working in the media workforce, 40,000. That's the lowest it's been since 1978 and the number keeps going down. About a month ago, you might have seen it, the Chicago Sun-Times laid off their entire photography staff. Pink slips for all of them. Um, and so the question when I read that article was, man, why aren't we standing in the parking lot of the Chicago Sun-Times and handing out Navy brochures? Hey, come on aboard. Um, because uh, we, we, should be, we should be looking for that kind of talent out there. I, uh, I'm going back up to Dinfos uh, this week. Um, I think my visit's focusing on the C school uh, this time. But typically when I go up, I, uh, I spend a lot of time with our A schoolers. And uh, again, just the, the talent and the experience, it, it would absolutely just knock your socks off. But so the last time I went, I had breakfast with about a dozen or so of them. Half of them had college degrees or were close to getting a college degree when they joined the Navy. And about the same number, um, had prior civilian work experience as public relations uh, officials or marketers and advertising, and even some journalists. And that is not uncommon, at least from my 
anecdotal uh, trips up to Dinfos. There's a, a, a amazing, first of all, our MCs tend to be a little bit older uh, than a lot of other recruits because they're coming to us with this great civilian experience. But I think it's just kind of happening to us. I mean, maybe it's a function of this economy and the fact that you know reporters and, and uh, editors and producers are losing their jobs as, the, as this media conglomeration forces this competition at the top. Maybe that maybe it is just it's, it's just happening to us, but I don't want it to just happen to us. I want us to go out and find that talent, go look for it, because it's there. Um, and if they have the opportunity, you never know how many will, will take us up on it. But imagine, uh, you know, uh, how useful it would be to have a former reporter there with you as you're writing PAG. Amberlyn Daniel over at the, the CMPs, is she here today? No? Um, former uh, uh, local reporter up in Oregon. Uh, and just so when when, when Amber Lynn's looking at PAG over there, she's looking at it from the lens of a of a journalist, which is just incredible for us to have the wealth of that experience. So I think we all should try to be recruiters. We all should be out there scouting for that talent. Go find your reliefs. Go find the future of the community. And boy, if they can come into us with all that experience, so much the better. And here's the other thing: when they get out, whenever it is they leave the Navy. They'll probably go back to that kind of work, but now they'll go back with an appreciation of, of the United States Navy and what the Navy is and does and can offer. I mean, so it's just this, it'll, it'll just be this great virtuous cycle of uh, refreshing the talent inside the community. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I know that wasn't your point of your question, but it's, a, but it, it's been on my mind. And again, I'll, I gotta solidify these thoughts and I'll tee them up in an email to everybody. But I think we all should be out there scouting for that kind of talent. Great point. Anything else? Sir, we have another one. It's from Corey Kelly. He's assigned to the NSW Center Indian Head EOD Division. He asks, um, with the use of enterprise level social media management and mentoring tools like Sprink Sprinkler, Salesforce, Hootsuite, et cetera, is the Navy taking any steps to purchase tools like these and make them available to its individual activities and practitioners or is it up to individual commands to identify and purchase the services they need to support the organizations present at the local level? Hmm. I don't know. I, I, I don't. Um, Chris, do you have thoughts on this? Well, we've tried to address issues like copyright music by bringing a, an enterprise license for uh, music for the multimedia pieces that show up in social media, but in terms of some of the analytic tools, uh, it, that's going to fall on the individual organizations. Right now, the enterprise it falls licensing on the would be astronomical. Yeah. Okay. All right. So right now, it's going to fall on the commands to to do this. And do we think we need to look at um, at a more centralized approach, or is that not in the realm of feasibility? I'm asking because I don't this. I have not thought about this before. To be honest with you, sir, I, I think it bears looking into to see what we can come up with from some of these uh, organization, commercial organizations that might entertain it. Yeah. But then there's there's information assurance issues that we have to take into consideration. There's a there's a lot of tails to these, these yeah. initiatives that That's a good point. we've got to look into. Okay. But I, I'd love to uh, you know investigate it further. Okay. Thanks. That's all we can ask. Appreciate that. It's a good question. I hadn't even thought of that. Anything else? Lieutenant Commander. I'm burning it up here. Lieutenant Commander Sarah Higgins uh, at NavInfo East uh, says we have uh, numerous events here in New York City that feature two speakers, a military service member and a uh, civilian business leader. Unfortunately, I've noticed a trend that the civilian speakers are usually more engaging than their military <laughs> counterparts. As communication advisors to senior leadership, how important is it for PAOs to develop their commander's public speaking skills, and how can we do, do so more successfully? Thank you. <laughs> uh, since I'm doing such a great job today, I don't know that that question's well placed to me. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's a great point. Um, uh, and you've heard me talk about this before, the power of public speaking and of speech writing and speech giving and how important that is for all of us to embrace. And as we advise our bosses to help them embrace that as well, it's hard work. 
it's hard work to go into a room and or face a crowd and to, and to be prepared to know what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. Um, and, and I don't know that we, and I've said this before, I, I don't know that any of the services, not just Navy, uh, really em, uh, embrace that function. We really teach it. I think the Marines do a pretty good job of that. I mean, I remember going through Marine Corps OCS and they made us all uh, give a speech in front of the platoon, and I think they still do that. I think they still raise Marine officers to, um, to focus on public speaking, but I don't know that the rest of us really do. It's uh, oftentimes not something that you have to do until you're in command at the 05 level and then as a flag officer, and it's not the kind of thing that uh, a lot of people find in, enjoyable, but it is vital, it is important. And I think we, we, we as advisors and counselors to our bosses, and this is why I want PAOs to own the speech writing mission. Uh, it's up to us to try to, to get them out there and to help them, uh, to help them do a good job. I used to, uh, I, I thought I'd be able to get through an all hands call without a Mike Mullen story, but here goes. <laughs> I got a bunch of them. Um, I, get, I actually came up with, and I'll ha I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants to see them. Um, I came up with a report card, literally a card, a five by eight card that I, that I printed and, uh, and uh, copied uh, with uh, uh, grades for every aspect of his public speaking. How much he used his feet, how much he used his hands, how many ums he said. I used to count all that stuff. Um, and then I'd give them, you know, A through F on each of those topics, and then we'd, I'd give them an average grade after each one. And at, it didn't matter what the public event, whether it was an all-hands call on a ship or uh, a major speech at, uh, at a university or the press club or in front of the, at the podium in the press room, um, we would, I'd be grading them real time, and then we'd always spend about 10 minutes afterward going over it. And he would try to argue for a curve, you know, and, and I... <laughs> And I wouldn't give it to him, um, but but he valued that experience and and that feedback, and I appreciated the opportunity to give it to him, and it helped. I mean, I learned, I learned a lot about public speaking. Not that you would know it today, but I did, and and uh, it is a part of what we do and what we should be doing for for our bosses. There's a a real a reason why I I put the eloquent president on my reading list. Now, there's lots of books you can read about speech writing, um, but I think the, what I liked about that book is that you're, you're reading about it through the eyes of Abraham Lincoln. You're not, you know, it's not a textbook. It's not a how-to list, but he knew that he was weak as a public speaker when he got elected to Congress, and he knew that he wasn't going to advance any of the initiatives he wanted to advance, even as a congressman, uh, if he didn't work on the art of public speaking. And so he pushed himself very, very hard. And he got to the point where, of course, you know, you get to the second inaugural, which is sheer poetry. I mean, the Gettysburg Address is still obviously a, the speech, the, the, the quintessential American speech. But that second inaugural, go take a look at that today and read that. It's almost poetry. Uh, and, but, he, but he understood that. And, I, you know, you've heard me talk about the Declaration of Independence, so I'm going to do it again. Uh, I'm reading this great book right now called American Scripture, which is about how the Declaration of Independence was written. I mean, how they actually chose the words and where they came from. And we have this image in our mind that Jefferson sat in this loft all by himself and scribbled it all out, you know. Um, and there's, there's some truth in that, but a lot of the words came from things that Jefferson and the founders had read before. Some of it came from the English Declaration of Rights from the 1600s. Some of those phrases and words, but they found a way to artfully put it together. And when they first published the first draft of the Declaration, um, and it was a mistake, they, they, there were marks on it. After every, so, after every few phrases or sentences, there were these weird marks. Jefferson knew that this was being written for the ear, not the eye. And he knew that it was going to be read out loud to a population which was largely illiterate. And so he put those marks in there to remind the speakers to pause, where to pause. Now, it got taken out in subsequent uh, publications, but the first one that was printed in Philadelphia had those, those marks on there uh, because he knew that that's what it was for, that it was real eloquence. Uh, and so they, they knew even back then the power of public speaking, and I think we all can learn from that, and we should be pushing our bosses to do that. Any more? Part of that, what Sarah just at was just 
pure repetition, right? Anything yep. we do, the more we were doing it, we were getting better as an enterprise. Yep. And now we've gone from sort of 60 to zero, you know, sort of the reverse of outreach in terms of money. Do you worry that that, uh, as an enterprise or as a corporate maybe, that's going to atrophy? Sure. I mean, practice makes perfect, particularly in public speaking. So the more you do it, uh, the question is, do am I worrying about with the outreach uh, the fact that we've gone from 60 to zero in outreach, uh, whether that's going to affect our ability to be good public speakers. And yes, I am. I mean, practice makes perfect. The more you do it, the better you get. Uh, that's obviously true. But what I really worry about with the, the uh, decline in our outreach budget and opportunities is the connection with the American people. Now, one way you facilitate that connection is through the act of public speaking and listening and Q&A. But I really do worry that uh, that if we're not careful, we're going to start to lose this very vital connection. And it is more important now than ever. I mean, it's the great irony, but as, the, as sequester hits and as the budget goes down, uh, and you, you need public understanding more than ever uh, to, to try to explain what we're going through and, and how it impacts the ability of their Navy to do the things that they expect of it. And back to sexual assault. Um, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at the press coverage of this issue and the rhetoric on the Hill to see that if we're not careful in the way we manage this, not just from a leadership perspective, of course that, but also from a communication perspective, that it will start to erode at the very foundation of trust and confidence that we have built with the American people, not just over the last 10, 12 years of war, but the last 20, 30, 40 years since the end of the Vietnam War. Um, and the, the military is still um, prized as the most trusted public institution. But I don't know if you saw, there was a poll out a couple of weeks ago. We dropped almost eight points. Eight points. Like that. And it's largely over this issue. So we've, you know, right at, right at the time when I think we need to be, be sharing our stories more, making them more personal, getting out and about, we can't. Uh, so I am worried about that from a, a larger institutional perspective. What else? Gary Nichols from the Center for Information Dominance asks, can we talk about the growing importance of photography and also social media? A photo is worth a thousand words. Yeah, I'd say a photo is worth a million words now. Um, uh, it, there's, uh, I mean, I, the, the world of visual imagery is so much more important now than it ever was. The quality is better, I and mean, what we're doing is really exciting stuff, and the, the quality, the ability to produce quality imagery, not just stills, uh, but video as well. Uh, the, our, th thanks to technology, we can do it much better than we ever could before, and much faster than we ever could before. And sometimes I think all you need is an image to tell a story. You, you almost don't need words anymore, depending on what the power of the image. So it's absolutely vital. Uh, and again, I saw that in spades when I was out there uh, in San Diego and up in Pac Northwest. Uh, uh, the uh, the time and attention that our MCs are are devoting to the, to capturing good imagery uh, and to getting it out there. Uh, and again, speed is everything because if you don't, you know, if 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 a picture does say a thousand words, um, it, it'll say a lot more than that if you can get it out faster uh, and you can be first uh, first out there with it. I mean. Let's talk about uh, the freedom in her deployment. And we've been very open and transparent about the issues that this ship has been having, good and bad. And that's the right thing to do. Again, it's an experimental platform. Uh, but I believe that we, we're starting to turn a corner here with LCS because we got imagery now of freedom out there doing the things that she was sent out there to do. Uh, and that's, that's a great thing for that conversation about LCS. It's easy to criticize the ship if, if, if it's tied up to the pier and it can't get underway because it's got issues. But now she is. She's underway. She's doing good things. And we're capturing that imagery. And that picture, that, that's all the proof you need. Nothing that I say or I write or interviews I give with trade press is going to change the narrative the way quite like an image can change it. Let me go back to the um, uh, sort of a, on a tangent, but not really. Uh, when, I was, when I was in San Diego, I had a chance to meet with um, the ownership of the San Diego Union Trib. I think I wrote about that. In fact, they gave me that line, you know, content is king, which I completely agree with. But the owner, a man named John Lynch, um, uh, he also said something else that day. You, some of you may have heard, heard me tell this story, but he had just, he just bought the paper six weeks ago, San Diego Union Trib. And uh, he said he pulled the, uh, all the employees together 
uh, on the first day, the first day after the, uh, after the acquisition. And he said, congratulations. Today is your last day as a newspaper. You are now a multimedia organization. And then he commenced to build them a state-of-the-art television studio down on the first floor. It's amazing. Um, and, they, and so Jen Steele, who was sitting there next to me, uh, some of you know Jen, in the meeting, um, she said, I, when I go out to cover a story now, I have a camera with me. And that camera doesn't sh just shoot stills, it shoots video too. And I'm expected to shoot both and to blog. And then when I come back after I write my story for the print edition, I got to go into the TV studio and they interview me about it live. And I take questions from viewers live. This is the world they're living in. It's the world we're living in. And I think that that's one of the great things about the merger. And I, I mean, the, um, uh, we're, what, 10 years on now with the merger? Is that right? 10 years, about that? Seven? Um, but I really think that Admiral McCreary was ahead of his time in the, in the merger. And I know that it, you know, there, were, there, there were fits and starts, and, and there was some frustration over it at the time. I remember that much. Uh, but I'll tell you, I, the Navy was ahead of its time uh, because we're creating now truly mass communication specialists. The sailors that can go out and get that content, the content that is king, uh, and get it in, in, in ways that's compelling visually, not just through the power of good words. So I, mean, I really think that we've got an edge. Um, a few weeks ago, um, the assistant commandant, General Paxton, asked me to come see him. And we had a great meeting. I've known him since he was the J3 on the Joint Staff. Um, and uh, he lauded Navy public affairs, particularly the MC community. And he said, that's where I want the Marine Corps to go. I want to create those kinds of PA professionals at the enlisted level that can, that can get that content in, multi -way, in multiple ways and quickly. Yes, ma'am. the Navy, um, what, what's important to sailors and, and what, um, what Big Navy's doing. How do we um, get that out to deployed sailors, or what other tools can we use to make sure that um, the folks out... That they're um, using it? Yes, sir. That's a great question, and that came up a lot during my trip. Uh, I got to do a better job making sure that the community knows it's there and it, it's available to them. Um, uh, I talked to, to uh, the folks at DMA about this. They are getting fleet submissions. They'd like to get more, um, and, uh, and so I, that's on me. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I wrote that Team PA when I came home. Uh, we should be encouraged. It is, I mean, the, the motto for all hands is, you know, for sailors, by sailors. And I really want it to be that way. Now, there's going to be some content generated in all hands that must come from, from, from here, from DMA and from Chinfo, particularly when it's policy-related uh, and, uh, and decision-making that's being done by the secretary and by the CNO. Uh, but in order to tell those very compelling stories, such as the senior chiefs, it's got to come from the fleet. Uh, and so I've got, that's on me. I've got to do a better job, and I would ask you to help me do that, but encourage those, those great MCs out there to submit their stuff to All Hands Magazine. And the editors there will work with them. If something needs to be tweaked or changed, we'll do that. Um, I, I heard um, Master Chief will testify to this, but I mean, I've, we hear this everywhere we go um, from some MCs that, they're being discouraged from writing uh, that, you know, feature length uh, and more personal stories. Uh, and they're being, some of them, not all, but some, they, they report being told, hey, you got to do it in AP style, inverted pyramid, you know, 30 word lead, boom, boom. And all. Again, there's a place for that. But if we're shutting down the whole ability to be creative, then we're really missing out on great opportunities to share what it's like to be in the Navy. Is that right? I think I got about five more minutes. Anything else from here? Yes, ma'am.
I don't want to speak for Dinfos, uh, uh, but it's a great point. And I, uh, let me have that discussion with Colonel Martin, uh, who's the. Yep, go ahead. Sure. If I uh, understand the, uh, the, the point, that really, of the question, it's uh, making more of the DENFOS courses available to civilians, or civilians being able to get into the DENFOS courses. Uh, we have expanded that, that ability uh, over the last several years or so, and uh, if you'll uh, contact uh, us in OI8, I'm Bruce Cole, and I'm in the global, B-R-U-C-E-C-O-L-E, if, if you'll contact me, uh, we can talk about uh, your particular circumstances or your particular circumstances or your particular circumstances, uh, all the folks who are out in the audience, and, uh, and we can see if we can, uh, we can make a match. Thank you. That's a better answer than mine. <laughs> all right, one more. Anything? Sir, we have a question from Todd Hack. He wants to know, um, He's found that a lot of our work, video productions, photos, and stories reach a limited audience on Navy.mil. How can we get more media products to reach a wider audience? Well, I'm going to invite uh, Chris to say a few words as well. But I would say, look, I mean, there we have, uh, there's, use social media as well. Use Twitter, use Facebook. I mean, uh, and I mean, and not, not just. Navy.mil Navy is one way. It's not the only way. Chris, you want to throw in there? Yeah, absolutely, sir. Uh, you know, I've always said that the best imagery stands on its own. If we get great content from the fleet, and we do every day, uh, we're not putting it just on Navy.mil. I mean, we're putting it on our social media platforms. We're marketing it through uh, some of our external tools like Vocus to get it to some of the niche markets in technology or in, in business or, or what have you. Uh, I think the challenge that we have is sometimes getting that metric or that analytic metric back to see where it played. We're pushing it down to the, to the Divids hub in Atlanta where they're doing a, uh, individual marketing. Um, we're pushing it obviously up to Dymoc to see how it might play in an all hands piece. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, to put it quite clearly, I mean, we're, we're constantly marketing that content exterior to, to Navy.mil. Maybe that mill is just one of the many places that we put it. Good answer, thanks. And that, that's a great segue to uh, last point. Content really is king. I mean, there, you hear me talk about the three words, content, context, and counsel, uh, but it has to start with content. It's out there, and it's being produced every day. I, I, I mean, it just is so inspiring to see what uh, our community is doing uh, and, and the stories they're telling about what they're doing. Uh, so keep it coming, uh, keep doing it, uh, and uh, again, we'll just continue to, to work with you to push it as far and as fast as we can. Listen, thanks very much. Um, uh, I know it's been a rough few weeks, uh, and it's going to be a rough few more weeks as we get through uh, this summer uh, and into the fall. Uh, I appreciate everything that you're doing, all of you, everywhere, um, and it is, it is one team. Uh, and everybody contributes to that team, and uh, I, I greatly appreciate the, the effort and the work that, the, that, you're, that you're expending every single day. It matters. Uh, so thank you very, very much. If you're going on leave this summer, please be safe. Give yourself plenty of time to travel. Have a good time. Relax. Enjoy the, uh, uh, whatever vacation time you're getting, but, uh, but please be safe and come back to us at the end. Thanks very much. Please carry on. Carry on.